Okay. I think we have to keep a schedule and uh, just start. Please uh, take seats. Uh, Good evening. Uh, I have a privilege to chair the last uh, plenary session of uh, this nice conference. My name is Emil Zoltayavka. I'm professor of material science and engineering at Technion in Haifa. And I would like to introduce uh, our distinguished uh, guest, Professor Siram Ramakrishna from Singapore, which is giving last lecture in this symposium. Professor Ramakrishna is currently the Vice President uh, for Research Strategy and Professor of Mechanical Engineering at the National University of Singapore. Before this, he served as the Dean of Faculty of Engineering during 2003 and 2008. He is also the founder and co-director of uh, Nanoscience and Nanotechnology Initiative in the same uh, National University of Singapore since 2002. Professor Ramakrishnan is a world-known expert in materials engineering. He is a fellow of major professional societies in Singapore, ASEAN, UK, and USA. He is a recipient of Cheng Chang Professorship of China, ASEAN Outstanding Engineering Award, News Outstanding Researcher Award, Lee Kwan Jeff Fellowship, and Cambridge Narrow Scholarship. Today, uh, Professor Ramakrishna will speak about the quest for clean energy, water, and regenerative medicine using nature building blocks. Please, Professor Ramakrishna, the podium is yours, 40 minutes. Thank you, Chairman, and good afternoon to all of you. I realize this is going to be a challenge for you. Uh, this being a last lecture, I'm sure uh, keeping the great attention would be a challenge. It is also equally a challenge for me because it's almost midnight in Singapore. So I'm trying myself to be awake and give you a nice lecture and wrap up this as the last lecture for the, this wonderful conference uh, put together by Nawam as well as his colleagues. Um, my goal today is to take you through some of the exciting work uh, we are doing at the National University of Singapore, but we're not the only one doing this kind of research. You would find there are a lot many groups around the world pursuing similar directions. So it is my pleasure to uh, introduce you, those who are not familiar with this area of research, those who are already familiar, perhaps this is just an addition to what you already know. And basically, I intend to focus. We have a platform concept and how that is useful in terms of uh, harvesting solar energy in treatment of the water, as well as dealing with regenerative medicine. I want to start with this particular slide because, because there's only one reason I wrote the book. The changing face of innovation is it shifting to Asia and it's coming out next month. So I thought I'll uh, take this as a free advertisement and I tell you. But what is more interesting is give you those numbers. Uh, these are the global R&D expenditure uh, according to the Battelle report, one of the uh, very well recognized R&D magazine called Battelle. Uh, they actually manage a large R&D organization in the United States. According to them, the number of uh, amount of research dollars that are committed around the world looks like that. And I think uh, with the years ahead, these numbers are likely to grow. Uh, that gives an idea how the innovation is shaping up in years to come. My outline is to basically uh, demonstrate that the natural building blocks, which are basically high aspect ratio fibers, does have a role in terms of uh, helping out solving some of the interesting issues we face today. I would start with uh, the population growth, 
obviously this is a, one of the serious concern and perhaps we are the generation witnessing a doubling of the population in our lifetime and if you notice which are the regions that are growing obviously india china africa are substantially growing and of course uh, other parts of the world as well uh, there is a certain degree of growth because of this growth as well as the high degree of consumption of the water as well as other resources uh, there is clearly going to be a shortage of water and in fact uh, yesterday's news they said more than a billion people uh, did not have a good access to the drinkable water and years to come next uh, 30 40 years that's going to be almost half the world population would be water stressed and the second one is energy again which is also theme of this particular conference uh, you notice uh, that these developing countries with a huge population base uh, they are beginning to have a better quality of life and they're going to actually absorb a lot more energy and eventually they would settle somewhere here in terms of the per capita energy consumption despite all the calls for global warming my guess is they would still continue to use large quantities of energy and here is an interesting scenario for you this is a 1973 global energy mix that is 2007 global energy mix if you notice almost 80% of the primary energy demand of the world is met through the fossil fuels which are basically oil gas and uh, coal and the renewables comprise about 18% that's about the total global composition or the energy mix now fast forward another 20 years is this going to change probably not especially after watching what is going on at copenhagen uh, discussions uh, one scenario the energy consumption is going to grow up totally but in terms of the total energy mix itself it is unlikely to change significantly unless uh, those people at the politicians as well as the policy makers at copenhagen summit decide to go that way that is they would have a much higher proportion of renewable energy as contributing to the primary energy needs of each country so essentially in a most optimistic scenario you could have a total energy mix of the world contributed by up to 40% from the renewable energy sources that's likely then of course you will see a lot more uh, nuclear hydro as well as solar energy wind biomass all those things and nuclear is particularly coming up very strongly in asia right now the close to 70% of the world's new nuclear reactors are being built in asia that amounts to about uh, 60 new nuclear reactors that would be coming on board in the next 10 years that's the scope uh, that is happening in in that part of the world coming to other one that's going to shape the landscape of the research is about the silver generation what we call basically people with an age above 60 years and that number is going to be more than a billion people in asia alone and obviously that would have enormous impact on the way the economies of the, that part of the world and obviously the the national governments would be asking uh, some other solutions uh, that science can provide so here are the reasons why regenerative medicine is likely to have a lot more interesting reasons one should focus aging population longer life span not long ago people were people were only living up, up to 40 years but now the average life span has gone up to close to 70 or 80 in certain countries and then chronic diseases are still there there is a rising demand for advanced medical solutions this is what is going on all those things would lead to more need for regenerative medicine so i have convinced you why we chose those three platforms as our target for applying this uh, building blocks of nature which is basically nanofibers water energy and aging so nanofibers nothing new that these fiber structures are there everywhere in fact all the wood panels you are seeing it has a cellulosic fibers and so is the bone all our human tissues in our body has this uh, this particular structures uh, this is slide from my friend rob richi from berkeley and here is the bone and you see actually collagen fibers these are the fibers that provide the certain degree of rigidity stiffness as well as uh, toughness 
to our bones. That's why we are able to jump, we are able to twist and turn, and we are able to chew as well. And here is the, those who are a lot more interested how exactly this mechanism works. Basically, these fibers are very nicely arranged, and it has a combination of organic and organic phases, and these are very structurally arranged, and one could call biomimetic. Essentially, they provide a certain degree of crack bridging, uh, also providing toughness. There's a lot more details, the way these fiber structures are arranged in our human tissues. And I'll show you in my work how we actually biomimic this particular structure by using our process, and we produce uh, structures very similar to the natural bone. And of course, waters, uh, these are the spiders. They can walk on the water. Of course, we can't walk on the water, but they can. And uh, that's primarily because one of the reasons is they have these very fibrous structures in their legs. And uh, similarly, the geckos, uh, beetles, these things can walk and crawl on the vertical surfaces as well as glass surfaces. Again, reasons are attributed to the, uh, this kind of unique uh, fibrous one-dimensional structures, a very uh, sub-micron range uh, that are present in some of these uh, creatures that provide that unique ability. And silk fibers, you know that. This was, uh, of course, uh, China was the pioneer. And since then, last uh, 2,000 years, many people use silk. And silk is known for uh, very high quality properties as well as strength. And similarly, the spider silk, uh, which is also quite unique in terms of the toughness. And there are many research groups trying to synthesize uh, the same process to produce such a high quality uh, fiber systems. And if you notice, uh, these are the fibers, nanotubes, nanowires, nanobells. Uh, most of the work uh, in a nanotechnology. Uh, in fact, today I received a paper from uh, Tel Aviv University Vice President Ehud Gajit. He has been producing these nano, uh, uh, nanofiber structures from peptides uh, from the bottom-up process. Uh, what I'm talking about is a top-down process of producing nanofibers, uh, much more simpler, uh, reproducible, and can be done in large quantities and, and the, on the industrial scale. So that is the process of basically electrospinning, and uh, this is the process how it is done. You basically have a polymer solution. It could be melt solution, and you apply very high voltage and a very low amperage, and that provides certain, uh, that certain uh, dynamics into the polymer solution system. Essentially, that provides a very fibrous structure like that. So most of the theories for this process are somewhat known. The basic process is known. There's a lot more work is going on in, in terms of optimizing the process. Now, if you take that process and you play with it, here is the ways you can actually play with it. You can produce uh, unidirectional fibers. You can crisscross them. You could actually place them at a certain angles, and you can pattern them. You could also, of course, that's a machine which came out of my lab, which is uh, my former Japanese student. He's now selling this machine in Japan. And so this is a commercial process now to produce. So you could produce solid fibers. You could produce porous fibers. You could produce core shell fibers. You align them. You can layer them. You can bundle them, or you can make hollow fibers. It basically provides you the flexibility that you could do and then you could deal with a natural material system or synthetic systems or a combination of those two. And by further controlling the spatial control of the process, uh, by base, use, using electromagnetic systems, you could actually control the spot size. And you can see this is less than 5 millimeter spot size. Uh, this is being used uh, to, uh, to produce next generation dental implants. So my collaborator in the uh, Faculty of Dentistry, they're using this system to improve the quality of the adhesion between the dental implant and the host bone tissue. And of course, you can also play with it further. You can actually start writing in a specific way these fibers. It's pretty early stage, but that is also a direction that is feasible. Now, coming to water itself, as I said, water is a serious issue. There's plenty of water, actually. The problem is most of the water is in the sea, as you can see. Uh, for uh, Israel, I don't have to say, you've got plenty of ocean there. There is so much of water out there. And the main problem is the fresh water or the groundwater, which is uh, limited. 
And so that's a saline water. Mostly people use desalination systems. If it is a fresh water, you use like a varieties of filtration systems. Uh, here is what it looks like. Either uh, some of the surface water, you use basically the combination of microfiltration, ultrafiltration, and nanofiltration. And if you have to deal with the uh, uh, seawater, you use a reverse osmosis as well. And here are the va various things that are removed uh, from the water, essentially leading to the drinkable water. And here are those things. I just show you how we can use our nanofibers. Um, here is an example. In a microfiltration, this is a membrane which is a red color made from our uh, electrospun nanofibers. And that's the millipore, which is a commercial membrane. And it, for the same given pressure, it has much higher flux. So that means you have a lower energy consumption. And this is a proven. And right now, it is a commercial operation in Japan. Uh, it's a, a company from Czech. It has commercialized based on our concepts. And it is a real process now. And then you could play with the surface of these fibers. You can modify them, tailor this uh, porous structure within the surface layer. And you could use them as ultrafiltration. In this case, uh, we have managed to reject about 90% 90, 90 of the humic acid at a 0.25 PSI, as opposed to the commercial ones, which is about 30 PSI, would have a rejection of 35%. And the other one, you could further use uh, uh, interfacial polymerization of these fiber structures. You can control the surface, and you essentially uh, make a nanofiltration structures. Here is the nanofiltration membrane of a polyamide material, and that is uh, magnesium sulfate and pre test pressure, and that's a rejection level, and that's flux. And these are all commercially available uh, systems. And if you notice, it's uh, five times energy efficient compared to other systems. And right now, we are trying to uh, further develop this particular system using the same concept. Okay, hopefully one day we will solve the energy problem. Not yet, but I think that's where we want to go. Now, coming to the energy, we have a lot more similarities, Singapore and Israel. You can see here, we don't have no oil, no gas, no coal, no biomass, no wind, no hydro, no tidal, no geothermal. Essentially, we have no, no energy sources at all. So what you are left with, options, energy efficiency, solar energy or waste energy, basically those are the only things that are possible for Singapore. And here is the Singapore map, and that's Malaysia. Indonesia is on the back here, uh, on, the, on the bottom. And as you notice, the distances are not that large, so obviously nuclear energy would be a challenge for us to convince our neighbors. But we cannot deploy uh, in Singapore either because it's a highly urban center, uh, five million people living uh, 70 kilometers by 70 kilometers, such a small space. So obviously there is a serious issue. So we are looking at solar energy, but it, it turns out um, that may not be the ideal solution, but that's something we should pursue. So here is the sun belt of the world, and that's where we, this is the tiny dot here. We actually don't see it on the map. That's Singapore. And in terms of the technologies out there, the solar cells, basically the single crystalline uh, silicon solar cells, which is most widely used, and then organic solar cells and disensitized solar cells. And how these are the working principles. The reason for using these uh, one-dimensional nanostructures in uh, solar cells, especially the organic solar cells or disensitized solar cells, are these are the two reasons. One is uh, these, uh, because of these structure, uh, unidirectional structures, uh, we believe the space charge free region is a lot more evident uh, in a, a fiber structure compared to the nanoparticle. So obviously that would, that would give you much longer uh, diffusion times for the electrons to go. Uh, similarly, because of the one-dimensional nature of the structure, these nano rods uh, would have a better way to tunnel these uh, electric charges through the fiber to the uh, electrodes. So these are the two reasons why uh, we believe that's uh, feasible. And, of course, there are other processes which you can uh, explain. Yeah. I'll just show you some of the results. For example, uh, when you reduce the size of, size of the nanofiber, you could reduce it to 50 nanometers, or you can also go as small as 30 nanometers. Essentially, 
by heat treatment processes, you can control the crystallinity within the fiber, and also you can optimize uh, diffusion constants. And here is actually what we have done. Here is a, a solar cell which is made from the electro spinning, and uh, I just show you the, some other results. Um, yep. Okay, here is the results. So here are the these are the nano rods, nano wires, nano fibers. Basically, we define it based on the aspect ratio, and these are the uh, photo exciton densities and the diffusion const coefficient uh, compared to nano rods. Uh, nano wires, which is basically have a much higher um, aspect ratio, it gives you much better diffusion coefficient. This is 10 to the power of minus four, 5 and 10 to the power of minus 4. That's uh, an advantage by itself. And then, of course, you can do the doping of these fibers, titania fibers, and then you could actually improve the diffusion coefficients. And here are the examples of the performance of the solar cells, which we made about 5 to 7 percent, that are the efficiency. And then you could also apply the same thing in hybrid solar cell systems, and these are the results. But the key where we are heading now is combining concepts of uh, disinstanced solar cells as well as or organic solar cells, and make a photovoltaic fiber, basically that's the fiber, that is electrospun, but within that fiber, you actually have the electrospun TiO2 uh, nano rods on which you actually have the dye uh, molecules. So the whole thing is a photovoltaic fiber, and that forms a fabric. So it's essentially a new device structure we are heading towards. And we, are, we hope one day the fiber cloth would be a photovoltaic system. And obviously, that's how we are beginning to do our experiments. And these are actually the initial results where you have the TiO2 nano rods coated with the N3 dye, which is one of the ruthenium dye. And these are the examples how TEM uh, examples of these fibers. And you can make them with the different electrolytes, P3HT system as well as uh, lithium iodide systems. And what I wanted to show you is uh, the first proof of concept. Uh, that's the uh, dark current, that's the light current. And you notice that there is an improvement. So. If you look at the efficiencies are not very high at this point, but it proves the point such a concept would work. And now it's a question of optimizing this particular approach. And we have the issues in terms of recombination, charge collection issues, as well as the uh, dyes that are issues as well. So we are in the process of optimizing these. So this, uh, I was just listening to a session before where the, they were talking about the lithium ion batteries. And we have done little work. Here is the result. Uh, TiO2 anode materials. These are the nanoparticles. These are the electrospun nanofibers. They would provide a much better stable cycling ability than the nanoparticles. Here is the result. We have done up to 50 cycles. So there seems to be some hope in terms of new uh, anode materials for lithium-ion batteries using electrospinning technique. And of course, you could produce a whole range of materials, uh, PZT materials, zinc titanates, niobium oxides, using the same process. And uh, I would go now to quickly to the regenerative medicine. It's, uh, uh, I'm switching it to the next topic. Uh, this is a new topic which has been around only about 10 years. And globally, if you notice, right now the market value of the regenerative medicine is about $2.5 billion, and it is growing uh, substantially. And uh, that's the breakup uh, in terms of the breakdown, bioactive bone grafts, and other uh, skin material systems. And these are the busy slides I won't, but I'll just take you to the, straight to the results so that we can focus on what you wanted to know. Okay. So here is the uh, material, which is made by electrospinning as well as co-prespiration of hydroxyapatite. And you are actually producing a, a bone analog material, very similar to the bone. And here is an example of that material. And then if you implant that in uh, animal studies, and they seem to regenerate quite well. So we have now done a, a second batch of the implanting. And it's also being done, tested in the European countries as well. So this is the test uh, showing us very positive results. Now, the other strategy is use these nanofibers to isolate stem cells from the bone marrow. That's uh, also very necessary. And here are the, some of the results. 
These are the mesenchymal stem cells from bone marrow, and these are the cover slip, and these are the, uh, these are the nanofibers. Uh, if you notice, within 30 minutes, you could actually capture close to 50% of the stem cells that are available are present in the bone marrow using these nanofiber scaffolds. And here we are using collagen system. And of course, you further optimize it, you could get a much higher levels of retention of the bone marrow, almost close to 80%. And then you can further enhance this one by optimizing the surface of the collagen nanofibers with certain uh, protein molecules and you actually further get to the very high levels of retention of the stem cells. The whole idea is you have a nanofiber scaffolds which are very specially suited to absorb the mesenchymal stem cells from the bone marrow so that you can use that for treating the patients in terms of the bone or other areas. And here is an example where we are also using the system to coat the stents. And here is a, if it works, and you actually see that's a stent coated with nanofibers, and of course those nanofibers could be drug loaded. And right now we are on the animal studies in stage one. Similarly, the nerve conduits, where you could use for the peripheral nerve regeneration, these are the autographs that's normally you take it from a, a, a vein from one location and apply it to another location. This is the commercial ones. These are nanofiber conduits which we made in the laboratory, and you, you look at the sensory activity of the rats, uh, they behave much better. So there is a huge potential in using these conduits for guiding the axons to grow in a specific direction. And now there's work coming up in Australia to use the same concepts for the central nervous system as well. And the last I uh, wanted to show you, in terms of skin regeneration, here is the control. That's nanofibers and nanofiber, nanofiber scaffolds with a large number of cells and it's a day zero and day 10, and you actually see that uh, the regenerative ability of these particular nanofiber scaffold systems. Right now, Vietnam, it is going on a human trials, and probably next time I'll be able to show our results on the human trials. So in, in Singapore, we are done up to animal studies too, but in Vietnam, they're now doing the human trials. The last one, which we are now coll collaborating with Technion, uh, is, the pa is a topic called Regeneration of myocardial infarction. Here is the infarcted uh, heart. Idea is to develop these particular nanofiber scaffold patches to, to treat the patients with myocardial infarction. So we are, this is a large program we're now doing with uh, Technion. Uh, I just want to convince those who are not convinced. It's an interesting area. About 800 papers are being published in electrospinning right now. And it's a relatively young field. About seven years ago, not that many people were active, but it's growing very well. And that's a citation trend. This is how the activity trend in various countries. And this is just not a laboratory process. You actually see a number of companies uh, around the world actively involved in electrospinning process. And these are the lab, these are the commercial machines that are available out there already. So I just want to show you this slide and I'll finish my uh, presentation today. Uh, this was done by my students. Uh, they figured out you don't need to do such a complex project. Let's do something simple. So what you have is a Petri dish. There's a beautiful lady out there. And this side is uncoated, and this side is basically coated with nanofibers. And because these nanofibers has a wicking effect, it basically takes away the water and then uh, uh, remove, it provides a clear uh, vision. And so they are thinking now, to use it for this kind of application. This is the rear view mirror, and this is a coated rear view mirror, and obviously you can see the difference. So with that, I just want to say, it's a field rapidly evolving. I would imagine the breakthroughs can come from any part of the world. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Professor Ramakrishna, for a very comprehensive analysis of uh, many important problems for mankind. And uh, uh, I think we have uh, plenty of time for questions and comments, uh, please. Uh, yes, uh, Anthony. Okay. There are a few. 
the when the first process maybe i give the detail the first patent was filed about 100 years ago and i think it's a uk citizen but filed in the united states about 100 years ago nothing really happened for 50 to 60 years then the russians were started using during the second world war for the chemical uh, warfare protection as masks and things and then it resurfaced in the uh, united states a company called donaldson started using this for agricultural purposes where they're using this as a filter for the agricultural tractors and those kind of vehicles if you look at what they have done essentially they use this technique and just sprayed the fibers which are basically submicron in nature since then what has improved is ability to understand what exactly happening how the fiber is produced from a polymer solution to such a very fine size in a, compared to the conventional process you need to draw it to many times whereas you don't actually do anything so the process of evolution of this taylor cone further reduction into the very fine dimensions that has been clearly understood the innovations are how do you produce let's say a specific orientation or a specific diameter these are the where the advancements were made and more advancements came on actually the material systems that are used and thus this material systems would would now provide better properties if you have this fiber structure so this is uh, for example pzt material the same material in the film form uh, would have a certain properties if that same thing is produced now with a nano fiber structure uh, it would have a different uh, degree of the piezo uh, piezoelectric effect that has been reported so the unique properties in terms of the piezoelectricity uh, the unique properties now we have reported in terms of the diffusion coefficients for the electron uh, those are basically the structures uh, that are feasible in this one third one is in a regenerative medicine i still remember about 15 years ago when i went to johns hopkins i went with uh, my fibers most people were using uh, uh, hydrogels and uh, phase separated scaffold systems they thought that's good enough but i can tell you now almost i would say 50% of the united states tissue engineering groups they definitely has electro spinning as a part of a way to produce scaffolds because they just found the fibers need three dimensional structures and you also need a way to uh, send the nutrients and oxygen and other elements as you are doing the tissue culture so that's uh, i would think consider as a breakthrough and is there a real breakthrough in terms of the blockbuster application in terms of the tissue regeneration not yet yeah yeah please uh, resolution uh, if i understand correctly yeah. the fibers that you are talking about are polymer fibers essentially yeah. and uh, of course uh, their mechanical properties are limited can you comment on the status or on the efforts of uh, trying to increase the mechanical strength of these fibers by let's say in, as an example introduction of uh, carbon nanotubes or diamond crystallites or what is what what is done in, in in that direction yeah good question in that um, there are two things uh, majority of the work in the last 10 years has been focused on polymers but now you are beginning to see a trend of moving towards metal oxides primarily because of the electronics and optical that kind of applications and in terms of the polymer systems uh, the work that is done is uh, there are only 3 to 5 groups that are focusing on mechanical aspects and they have focused on the looking at the crystallinity aspect how does the crystalline crystalline structure or the polymer from a solution to the fibrous structure when you electro spin uh, what is the change in the morphological aspects and how that actually improves the mechanical properties in this case mainly the tensile strength and uh, they use the afm atomic force microscope is the way to Uh, characterize these systems and they there is some reports <clears throat> especially from Drexel University and a few others uh, introduced started introducing uh, carbon nanotubes inside and recently they're putting inside uh, fullerenes as well as the um, there's a newer structures that are being put there but again they are while they're exploring the mechanical aspects they're also branching out to functional films where they are looking at super capacitor systems they are looking this as a material for the uh, the batteries as a separator 
So uh, between uh, 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 the, some of the uh, battery systems, electrochemical systems, they are using this again. So very few groups completely focusing on the improving the mechanical aspects. Many others are looking at a multiple functionality. Uh, is there a scope for doing more work in terms of improving the uh, properties? I would think so. Uh, there are people now working on carbonizing this one, producing just carbon fibers out of that. And then how do you improve the properties of those fibers as well? And then it depends exactly uh, where the application is. For example, in water filtration, uh, eventually the strength comes into a picture because you're not pushing the water, a small quantity of water, this is a large vol volumes of water being pushed through the membrane. So the mechanical integrity, a longer period, able to survive the back flush, all these things have to be worked out and mechanical aspects would need to come in. Uh, maybe why they did not focus is, it is somewhat difficult because you need a special instrumentation to handle this, such a fine fibers and the loads in model are not that high, but so that's probably why uh, most people did not focus, but that's something one should focus as well. Yeah. Other questions? Can you elaborate a little bit more on the solar cell application, and in particular, what is the architecture? Are these uh, fibers uh, somehow or other erect on the electrode, or are they just laying randomly? Uh, we all hope we can erect them in a vertical or uh, one of the direction, but right now most of them are random. And they're roughly in the thickness of about uh, several microns. So we build certain thickness. And one of the key problems there is the, it delaminates. So most people are focusing on how to avoid delamination. So the later approach, which I just said, uh, we're now not focusing on just the how do you put these vertical fibers on a um, FTO glass? The question is, can you actually make a completely photovoltaic fiber by electrospinning? And that's probably gets it uh, more interesting, and that's probably where there is a scope and edge for such a process. Otherwise, you are competing with other processes. So my own view is uh, making a completely photovoltaic fiber using this process would have an edge. Uh, only one company that is doing in the fiber structure that is Konarka uh, in the United States, and of course the EPFL is involved, but their process is not electrospinning, they do the multiple coating. Uh, I do not believe uh, that would be a, a system that would provide the, what we call uh, solar fabrics. That would be just a, a thick rods, that's what they can come up with. If they had to go towards the really truly photovoltaic fabric system, they have to figure out how to produce uh, how do you put all these systems inside? You need to have the, both anode, cathode, electrolyte, dice as well inside. And eventually that has to work as a complete system in the fiber form. And the second issue is how do you actually tap the electrons out? So that's, these are the serious challenges. But whoever can do it, even with 1% efficiency, I think it's already done. Because you do not need, this is for the low energy applications. So I think uh, even if they can, anybody can come up to 1% efficiency, I think they already have a, a good certain scope in the market. That's my belief. Thank you. And uh, I think I'm not seeing more uh, people would like to ask questions in the uh, little bit uh, recent time. I, I think uh, we have to thank speaker again for a very nice presentation. Thank you. And by this, the scientific part of the conference is finished. I, I guess organizers are here and are ready to close, uh, to close uh, the conference and to provide some remarks. Uh, Noam is here, or Ilan Goldfarb, somebody from organizers. Ah, <laughs> you. Yeah. Okay. Well, actually, we're waiting for Elon and Noam to finish, but uh, they should be appearing momentarily. In fact, I see Elon now. So.